Okay, this is a pretty surreal spot that I find myself in. Behind me, I have a decommissioned nuclear warhead. But that's not even the weirdest part of it. This is an old McDonald's right here, and it is inside here where the original moon tapes are. They're actually being converted so that we can see them online into all sorts of new modern media. Let's go check out how they're doing it. This is the world's most unique McDonald's. But you know, for me being in here is like a sci-fi movie. Just have a look around. I mean, there is an incredible amount of technical gear here. But how did this operation, it's a pretty high-tech operation, how did it come to be inside a McDonald's, an old McDonald's? Everybody recognizes the shape of the McDonald's building and they don't pay attention to the fact that there's no McDonald's signs and when they look in the door there's a bunch of scientific equipment. <laughs> we even had someone come in one time and we said, this is not a McDonald's anymore and they said, well can we at least get a Coke? And I said, well I'll get one out of the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> so did you give it to him? Yeah. recording the first images that came back from the moon? Well, these are the first images from the orbiter missions, whose goal was to map the moon. Engineers of the Boeing Company and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration are making final preparations to launch one of a series of lunar orbiters. The lunar orbiter program, originally as it was designed, was not scientific. It was a photo reconnaissance mission to look for spots for the Apollo landing. That drove them to do a very high resolution system. Scientists on Earth will obtain their first precise information. The spacecraft had two cameras, a high resolution camera and a medium resolution camera. They actually had a light beam that would go and scan the images and then broadcast that back to the Earth. When it got back to the Earth at the three ground stations at Wimmera, Madrid, and Goldstone here in California, the images were actually directly recorded on two inch videotape. And these tapes right here that we actually have, and one is on our machine even as we speak, these are the actual original tapes from those ground stations. Now tell me, if you weren't doing this, what would happen to these tapes, to these images? Gone. We would just lose them. Well, there is a version of these images in existence. They recorded this on 35 millimeter film on the ground. But there's a problem with that in that the 35 millimeter film has only one fourth the dynamic range of what's on these tapes. Now I'm going to turn it on here and you're going to see the noise. Whoa! This is the highest data recording media of the 1960s. There were three questions that we had to answer for this project. The first one was, can you bring one of these tape drives back to life after 40-something years? The second, is there any data left on the tapes? Some of the NASA people didn't think so. Then, if there is data on the tapes, is that data better than what we already have in the film record? And we answered all three questions in the affirmative. And so, our very first image was the famous Earthrise image headlined all over the world, the first image of the Earth seen from behind the moon. Understand that this was a picture of the Earth from August 23 of 1966. It was the first image ever of the Earth from the moon and it really, really, really touched a lot of people. What was the resolution of that image? When it is at full size, it's 60 feet wide and 20 feet tall. So that's at 72 DPI at full resolution. That's extraordinary. Yeah. So ours is four times the dynamic range, and it's immediately apparent. We now can bring this into the modern age, so it allows any researcher in the world who wants to do a comparative analysis there's so much of our technological civilization that's just thrown out. Think about how much different our world would be today if the engineering drawings for the Great Pyramid had survived, or the Great Wall of China, 
what if that technology had survived? So to us, the greater societal importance of this is, is it's important also to preserve our technical heritage. It's called techno-archaeology, literally the archaeology of technology, and that's what we do here. That's cool. Thank you so much. The surface appears to be very, very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. In order for us to be able to look forward in the future, we have to understand where we've come from in the past. Uh, society is like a plant. It either grows or it dies. We want to help the plant of our society grow, and our project is part of that.